Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch, because I had. So um, <clears throat> uh, I was given to chair the last session of uh, the whole uh, seminar. They, t they said uh, this is a very important part of the session, so that's, that, that's why it was given to me. Yeah, that's a round applause to myself. Yeah, uh, today, uh, now we start with uh, um, Joanna Abruzic, yes, sorry, uh, with uh, your PhD student here at o and m and uh, she'll be uh, having 25 minutes, but you have to use 20 for your presentation, the five, four questions. And uh, you have uh, the floor to yourself, and uh, good luck. Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Aburisk from Lebanon and uh, thank you for having me today among you uh, at the last session uh, of this uh, interesting uh, Clive Food seminar. Um, um, under the session topic of today, which is assessing food and nutrition security, I will take the opportunity to present to you my uh, PhD project thesis uh, on maternal and child nutrition among Syrian refugees and uh, host communities in uh, Greater Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, I will start first with the general background on the Syrian humanitarian crisis and the current nutritional situation in Lebanon. And then I will briefly talk about the window of opportunity the, and malnutrition and move on to the objective methodology and the preliminary results of our uh, PhD project. So the Syrian humanitarian crisis is now the largest of our time. Um, it has been uh, recorded that um, Syrian refugees are the largest refugee population worldwide, exceeding 5 million, and of which the majority are hosted in multiple countries in the Middle East, such as uh, Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. In Lebanon, for instance, um, uh, Lebanon is host of the world's highest per capita concentration of refugees. Um, it was documented that one out of four people in Lebanon now is a Syrian refugee, of which the majority are women and children. And with a relatively fragile uh, political, social, and economic system in Lebanon, uh, the nutritional status of these vulnerable groups, children under five and women of productive age, is increasingly compromised with the protracted crisis. Especially in the most vulnerable localities, the, excuse me, the, the red areas, whether it was in the most uh, urban settings or in the rural settings, uh, these red areas indicate that uh, there's a high concentration of uh, deprived Lebanese and refugees in the same area, and uh, these are the most vulnerable localities. So what is the current sit nutritional situation now in Lebanon? Um, uh, I will start with the Syrian refugees. It was documented that they suffer from uh, low dietary diversity score, especially the children, and that the majority are um, food insecure and in need of mental health support. While for the Lebanese host community, uh, we know that even since before the crisis, uh, micronutrient deficiencies were widespread and um, inadequate infant and young feeding practices were already present uh, before the crisis. And recently, more studies showed that there's an increasing, increased burden of uh, food uh, insecurity, especially in the urban uh, setting and urban households. So why is nutrition for uh, this uh, age group, women and children, important? I'm sure that most of you last week in the Congress of Hidden Hunger, uh, um, I'm sure a number of you attended it, so uh, this topic was covered, and I will just uh, highlight it again uh, really quickly. Uh, nutrition in the first thousand days, starting from pregnancy and the gestational age until the first t uh, two years of age uh, for a child, are most important because it has been shown that nutrition is tightly linked to um, the programming of diseases in adulthood. And any form of malnutrition or micronutrient deficiencies in this age uh, can, can lead to uh, irreversible effects on the physical and cognitive development of the child. But also, um, for women of reproductive age, um, malnutrition in this window, uh, also uh, in, um, in the pre-pregnancy period and adolescence and when they are adults, can uh, lead to increased risk of micronutrient deficiencies like anemia and eventually lead to poor birth outcomes and affect also the child. 
this is why the window of opportunity is uh, critical and uh, is an important time to make uh, uh, nutrition interventions. Uh, so to improve um, and to prevent forms of malnutrition, whether it's uh, overnutrition or undernutrition, and to uh, also uh, look at uh, micronutrient deficiencies and uh, improve the nutrition status of uh, the vulnerable groups, especially when it comes to uh, women and children in, in fragile settings and among refugees. And this malnutrition framework, uh, which also I'm sure um, um, most of you are um, um, they know it from the UNICEF in 1990, it was developed uh, at this time. So we can see that malnutrition is um, the immediate manifestation of the immediate, is the outcome and manifestation of the immediate causes, underlying causes and the basic causes. And um, I will tell you in a bit why I'm explaining this framework again, because it's pretty popular and uh, uh, we will reach to a conclusion. So uh, we can see that malnutrition is the outcome of immediate causes, which can be uh, inadequate dietary intake and the presence of disease at the individual levels. Underlying causes that can be uh, present mostly at the community levels related to inadequate access to food, uh, inadequate care for children and women, and also insufficient health and uh, ser services um, and unhealthy uh, environments. But also malnutrition is uh, the outcome of basic causes related uh, to uh, politics and economy and other factors at the global and national levels. Now why uh, did I come to this uh, framework? is just to show how uh, the definitions of food security and nutrition security, they overlap together and they both can lead to uh, malnutrition if you have food insecurity and food uh, and nutrition insecurity and how both definitions can overlap and nutrition is present in both definitions. So we can see that food security uh, mainly uh, can impact uh, in, uh, inadequate access to food, which will lead eventually to inadequate dietary intake and then to malnutrition. And of course, the important um, pillar of food security related to the utilization of food that is uh, important also for the nutrition uh, perspective of food security. But if we look at nutrition security, we see that the definition overlaps with the framework and, and on uh, food security. Nutrition security covers the topics of inadequate access, but also inadequate care for the child and the woman, and insufficient health services and unhealthy um, environments that can both lead to uh, the presence of diseases, inadequate dietary intake, and eventually to malnutrition. So this is why, um, Starting to, uh, with a window of opportunity is important for these vulnerable uh, uh, population groups. Now I will go more into my uh, PhD project with my PhD colleague, Teresa Jeremias. She's also a PhD student uh, here at Hohenheim and uh, we're working on the project uh, together. So um, we're working on maternal and child nutrition among Syrian refugees and Lebanese host communities in uh, Greater Beirut, Lebanon. Our main objective, I will not read the exact words, is to assess the prevalence of anemia and also to look at the determinants of anemia. And what could be the determinants? So we will look at the associations between anemia and nutritional status, dietary intake, food insecurity, but we also included the mental health of the mother, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, depression uh, also of the mother, the depression status of the mother. But we're also in this project, because it's a big project, we are interested in, uh, as in uh, investing investigating the barriers to uh, IYCF, to proper breastfeeding and complementary feeding, but also to um, an uh, adequate diet rich in hemanitic nutrient-rich foods. Uh, what are hemanitic nutrients? There are uh, nutrients important for um, hemoglobin production and prevention of anemia that include iron, B12, vitamin B12, folic acid, vitamin C, vitamin A, zinc, and copper, and other nutrients as well. And we will also examine the effectiveness of nutrition education intervention on improving the dietary diversity among the children, the women, and also uh, improving the hemoglobin levels among this age group, uh, among this population group. So how, uh, what is the design of our project? We have two phases. Uh, phase one is the cross-sectional study, we, uh, which is um, Make, uh, which has mixed research methods, the quantitative and qualitative uh, approaches will be used, both of them. And we have also the intervention study, which is phase two, where a nutrition uh, and counseling, uh, nutrition education and counseling intervention study will be uh, conducted. 
I will start more, I will focus more today on uh, phase one, and then later I'll tell you uh, slightly more about the objective of phase two, but phase one, because it has been uh, completed, and I can show you more on the results and the methodology that you used so far. So, um, the cross-sectional study took part in the most vulnerable localities in Greater Beirut. You can see we selected six areas, uh, the most red uh, areas in, uh, in uh, Beirut, and we went to different primary healthcare centers there. Now, how is this definition exactly uh, prepared the most vulnerable localities in Beirut? It's based on the OSHA uh, map and the vulnerability assessment of localities in Lebanon, and it mainly uh, looks at three main uh, um, indicators. One of them is the multi-deprivation index that includes the access to health services, to wash, hygiene, education, and also to uh, housing conditions at the income levels. And the other uh, factor uh, in, the, um, in the calculation of vulnerable uh, localities is the population, Lebanese population residing in these areas, but also the presence, the number of uh, refugees also in these areas, the population concentration. So based on these numbers, then the areas are divided into uh, uh, different vulnerable groups uh, on a scale from one to five, with one being the most uh, vulnerable. Uh, for the data collection, uh, this is, uh, for example, a picture of the setting uh, of data collection. I will explain it to you more uh, as we go. So first, we were uh, approaching women in the primary healthcare center in the waiting area uh, and women with children. And if they met the eligibility criteria, which included Syrian and Lebanese mothers uh, aged between 15 and uh, 49, then, um, and if they had a child less than five years old, and the child did not suffer from any inborn disease or malformation, then they were invited to participate in the study. So in total, we approached 665 women, and 19% uh, almost uh, of them uh, did not agree to participate in the study, so our non-respondent rate was around 19%. And eventually, we had 539 uh, pairs recruited, of which 11% dropped out, and we, uh, uh, um, 478, mother-child pairs remained in the study and completed the questionnaire and uh, the participation basically in phase one. So interviews were made face to face with trained enumerators. We can see our enumerators are in the back and then the women are in the front with their children. And a multi-component questionnaire was administered to check on different uh, uh, indicators. So first, of course, we checked on socioeconomic characteristics. Uh, then we looked at the food security status of the mother using the FIES developed by the FAO. And we then checked the mental health status of the mother using the PHQ-9 for the depression status and the PTSD mini tool for the post-traumatic stress disorder status of the mother. We also checked for the lifestyle characteristics of the mother, um, alcohol drinking, uh, smoking habits, and physical activity. And uh, we checked for the health status and history of both the mother and the child and we completed a nutritional assessment for both the mother and the child. Now I will uh, tell you a bit more about the nutritional assessment. This is an example of how we can assess food and nutrition security, but of course there are different indicators available that you can use, but we decided to use uh, these indicators. So um, for the nutritional assessment, we started with the dietary intake for both mother and child. We checked what they had uh, the day before we, uh, by completing a 24-hour dietary recall for both of them. And then we checked for the mother the usual pattern, uh, dietary pattern, the usual intake by, uh, by using a food frequency questionnaire. And you can see here we used um, standardized tools that had uh, pictures of portions, and uh, this document also is not very clear here, uh, of which the mother would tell us, okay, I had this much of this food item, and then we had a standardized approach to collect uh, dietary data uh, on field. And also we asked questions related to um, infant and young child feeding practices for breastfeeding, um, food taboos, and complementary feeding, and so on. We also measured, uh, took some anthropometric measurements for the mother and the child. We measured the height uh, and the weight and the length for the child as well, and the mid-upper arm circumference. For the mother, we also measured the waist and hip circumference. And for the child, we took also, in addition, the head circumference. So we had a very broad um, view uh, on the nutritional status of both the children and um, the mother. And at the end, 
We measured the hemoglobin concentrations uh, of the mother and the child using the HemoQ uh, analyzer. So we would be uh, conducting finger pricks or heel pricks for the uh, small babies uh, to be able to get the blood drop and then assess the hemoglobin levels. Um, now also in the qu uh, phase one, in the first uh, part of the project, we conducted another study that was the qualitative study. It took part in uh, September to October, and uh, the response rate was even lower. And in this study, we had only 62 women of uh, those contacted from the study uh, who participated in focus group discussions and 20 in in-depth interviews. But we also uh, did interviews with key informants from uh, primary healthcare centers and uh, uh, NGOs and uh, UN agencies in Lebanon. Now I will show you some preliminary results. This is uh, just the beginning of uh, the analysis. So we uh, some results like food security I won't be able to show you today. We haven't um, analyzed it at the moment. So uh, looking at the preliminary results, we, s we had in our sample 93% of our participants were Syrian refugees and 7% was Lebanese, were Lebanese host communities. And if you look at the children, the age group distribution was almost equal between different age groups. A quarter were be aged below six months, and then um, a half of them was below one year, and then three quarter of them below two years, and then a quarter from two to five years. So it's almost uh, equally distributed for different uh, uh, important age groups. Now, if you look at the education level of the mothers, uh, and this, uh, these results are for uh, both Lebanese and Syrian, so we did not uh, separate the analysis at this point. Uh, it's both for the refugees and host communities. But in general, we found that even, uh, even though the literacy level were high, so at least 85% of them could read and write, but half of the group, of our study group, uh, did not uh, 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 only attended primary school. And then three out of four women did not go into secondary school or higher, uh, did not get any higher education than secondary school. So uh, education level was uh, relatively uh, low in our sample uh, among the Syrian refugees and Lebanese host communities. If you look at the type of job of the fathers, we found that even though the majority had a form of job, whether it was seasonal, daily, or full-time and part-time job of the fathers, if we combine them together, it's the majority. Um, even though ma the majority had a form of job, but uh, nearly 60% of the household uh, had an income less than minimum wage in Lebanon. And we found that 90% of the women uh, were housewives and did not have any uh, form of paid job. Now for the mental health of the mothers, like I mentioned, we assess for both uh, um, conditions. But I have to say that for the PSQ9 uh, scale, it has been validated in Lebanon. It has been shown to be specific but not sensitive. So it gives you, uh, it gives it, it could catch all the symptoms related to anxiety and depression, but it could not say it was not a proper diagnostic tool for depression. So this is why I marked here depression anxiety symptoms. So I don't want to generalize and say these women, all of them are uh, diagnosed with depression, but they did, they did display symptoms of anxiety or depression. So we found that 40% of our sample, which is a, a big number, nearly half of the women suffered from a f a symptoms related to uh, depression or anxiety, and one out of ten women uh, were suffering from the post-traumatic stress disorder in our sample. And then now looking at the nutri nutritional status, uh, also for the child, um, wasting, stunting, and overnutrition haven't been analyzed yet, but for now I'm showing you uh, results on the acute malnutrition. Only 2% of the children were suffering from uh, a global acute malnutrition, uh, showing that mal um, undernutrition was not the main issue at this point. Uh, now for the children, we need to conduct further analysis, but we can see this clearly for the mother, that overnutrition is mainly the concern in our uh, population. So we can see that um, nearly 60%, two out of three women with either, were either overweight or obese among uh, refugees or host communities in Lebanon. And now if you look at anemia, that was uh, my poster last week in the Congress of Hidden Hunger. Um, so I will sh um, zoom into the results so you can see it uh, clearly. I don't have to repeat the uh, introduction and methodology. So uh, we saw in the results that um, uh, one out of three child uh, were suffering from anemia in our sample. 
35%, and one out of four women were suffering from anemia. So these are um, high prevalences of anemia among Syrian refugees and host communities. And the majority were suffering from mild anemia mostly, and some of them of moderate, and only one case of severe anemia was recorded among children, and no cases of severe anemia were, were recorded among mothers. Now, if we look a bit into the details uh, of uh, further analysis for anemia among children, we found that um, anemia rates were found to be significantly higher among those aged 6 to 23 months old. But even when I combined these two in analysis, it was still significantly higher compared to the older children. So we can say that younger children were more likely to be anemic compared to older children. And also, anemia rates were significantly higher among mothers aged less than 25. So young mothers were uh, had higher risk of having um, children with young mother who had a higher risk of having anemia. So we can say, I will not talk with risk at the moment, I'll just say significantly higher the prevalence. <laughs> so, uh, and if you look at the mothers, maternal anemia was significantly higher than age zero to two. So also we can see that uh, the mothers who had children, young children were more likely to be anemic, 66% of them. So this is also a finding. We can say that um, young children had a higher, um, were more likely to be found anemic and mothers, young mother, mothers with young children as well. So it's both actually. Now for the intervention study, the second phase. So. Um, uh, based on the preliminary results and the phase one, uh, which is completed now, uh, we are now uh, designing uh, the education intervention study because we believe and we focus on nutri nutrition education because we believe that education and a nourishing diet can prevent anemia, but also improve dietary diversity and help in improving the nutritional status among different generations. So our nutrition education study will focus primarily on uh, giving education sessions and counseling sessions with um, uh, topics focusing on complementary feeding, anemia, to how to prevent anemia, but also we want to give the woman uh, local recipes uh, that are improved uh, to have a higher content in iron and improved with local ingredients as well. For example, we want to use more beans which have a lower ecological footprint, increase the intake of uh, vitamin C in combination with the beans and maybe uh, decrease the intake of tea, which can inhibit the absorption of iron and other nutrients. So basically, this is what we're trying to do is through um, nutrition education in combination with uh, local recipes, which we are developing at the moment. We want to try to improve dietary diversity and improve as a sub objective, the hemoglobin levels of the mothers and the children. I want to thank um, especially Food Security Center for uh, sponsoring uh, the project and uh, uh, sponsoring me as well. I am a food security uh, scholar and also the University of Hohenheim, but also B uh, BMZ, uh, DAAD and the EXCEED program and our collaborators in Lebanon, the American University of Beirut, Fiat Pines Foundation here and Barilla Center for Food Nutrition who awarded us the PCFN ES Research Award uh, two years ago uh, to conduct our project as well. And especially I want to thank our survey team. Uh, these are uh, volunteers, uh, students, uh, pre-med students who supported us in uh, data collection. Uh, and uh, I would like also to uh, acknowledge their, uh, their help. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> So, uh, thank you, uh, Joanna, for your uh, nice presentation thank and you. also a timely presentation. I have to say, uh, one of the presenters is not here for this session, so uh, uh, I didn't know that you were given uh, more time, That's 30 okay. minutes. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, the time is for questions. In there, if you have questions. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I just have uh, some comments, also one question. Mm -hmm. The comment is that uh, one of our PhD students in our university, he is working on uh, maternal depression, mm -hmm. and it would be good uh, if you communicate with him and support him. But my question is about um, uh, what was the need to, to have 
Lebanese and Syrian together. Mm. But then these uh, Syrian refugees went through a lot of problems and it's a lot difficult to include those in Lebanon together with those who went through this very difficult war. And mm. that is not the kind of undermined uh, problem they are going through. So mm. just wanted to hear your explanation. Yes. What was the need to include this 7% uh, Lebanese? 7%, Thank yes. you. Um, first, yes, uh, Siti Barak, I guess you're talking about, right? Uh, he's working on maternal depression in Ethiopia. He's also a PhD student here. So it's... Uh, not Teti Barak, yeah. So, but also a colleague of ours, he's uh, from Ethiopia and working on maternal nutrition, uh, depression, I mean, and he has uh, interesting findings as well. Now, why did we include the Lebanese uh, host community? Uh, if I understand uh, your question correctly, um, you, you mean to say because we had a history, um, uh, was it? Or is it because the sample size is really small? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we inc we included the Lebanese communities because uh, whenever in any country there are uh, cases of refugees coming, and especially if the country has a vulnerable uh, setting, whether, whether, it, whether it comes for the political or economic situation, then the most deprived host communities can be affected as well by the increased flux of number of people to the country. And um, uh, we have from the World Bank data showing that job opportunities decreased by more than 20% for the Lebanese and um, uh, life, ex uh, uh, life conditions maybe are different now. So we wanted also to see the impact of a humanitarian crisis in the urban setting, how it's affecting both refugees coming from a different country to a new country, even though uh, uh, they are neighbor countries, so they share a lot of um, similar aspects in the culture. And also want to see the impact on the local community. Now, why the number is really low? Because uh, now we notice in the centers that um, the host communities, uh, the attendance is low to the center. So this, these numbers are actually representative of who is going to the center. So if, you, uh, if our population is women attending vulnerable centers, uh, centers and vulnerable localities. So we technically were able to grasp and to correctly uh, display the correct distribution of uh, who are the women and children of vulnerable settings and vulnerable groups going to these centers. And we found that only 7% of the host community are going to centers to seek free access to uh, health services and care. So, and then now the qu question rises: why only 7% of, of them are coming? So uh, only a low number of them are coming, which is 7% in total, so I don't want to mix the numbers. So this is uh, a question we want to study now, the reason why, uh, the number is low, but uh, we wanted to include both, so we study the impact on both societies because it's always um, better to study the impact on the refugees and the host communities in the same community. I hope this answered your question. <laughs> you have a question, okay. Thank you so much for additional information from nutrition side of the refuge areas. I do have two questions, mm -hmm. and the first question is goes to the 24-hour recall method. Mm -hmm. 24-hour recall method. In that regard, how do you quantify the ingredient mm -hmm. from the mixed dish mm -hmm. while you are assessing the 24-hour recall? How do you quantify those ingredients yes. during the mixed dish? The other question is that uh, your intervention is education, mm -hmm. as we all know. Uh, these refugees are supplied a common and known type of foods by the donors like UNHCR or so on. So do you think that this nutrition education can have some inf influence or affect their dietary habit because uh, their meal is fixed and known, they are supplied mm -hmm. by from the common donors like Red Cross or Red Crescent and so on. How does education can affect their consuming pattern? Yes, sure. Thank you. So for the first question, the how did we um, um, analyze the 24-hour recalls and collect the data? So when we, uh, uh, in the training sessions for uh, uh, the students to collect the data, we made sure to tell them uh, when it's a mixed dish, get the recipe from the mom. So then the mother would tell us uh, if it's a standard dish that we know already and it's common in Lebanon, like a certain stew, then we already know the ingredients. But if it was a, a certain 
certain uh, mixture that she did by her own, we would ask her how how many uh, what was the recipe you used. So she would tell us, I used maybe four potatoes, five carrots, two onions, and this pot was served for six people. So then we enter the recipe and we know the ingredients and we know how many people ate from this pot, and then we can estimate, have a better estimate. But of course, we're using a nutrition software uh, called NutriSurvey. Uh, it uh, was developed uh, from uh, in Germany and uh, using also the USDA database and the database from Lebanon with the local food items, we're also able to know uh, the nutrition content of uh, uh, of the 24-hour dietary recalls. So with the proper training and uh, explanation to the woman and give her time to uh, give us the answer, we were able to collect the needed information. Now for the education, uh, for the for the intervention study, uh, WFP is taking care of distributing uh, food vouchers to the Syrian refugees. So they actually give them, they don't give them uh, predefined meals. They give them uh, like a credit card or a card. They will go to the supermarket with an amount of money inside. For example, for the household, uh, for each person in the household, they get a certain amount of money. I think now it's $27 per person. And uh, then they go to the supermarket, but to specific supermarkets uh, working with the WFP and they are many different options so they are not limited at all with the options or supermarkets and then they buy the items they need so they are not um, uh, really uh, um, limited in their options they can buy different options and what we try to do in the education intervention is with the little money they have we want to uh, improve their selection of food items for example if they decide to buy um, not really nutritious items um, on a regular basis, then they are not really taking advantage of this money distributing to them. So we try, we want to try to promote a cheap, local, and uh, nutritious food items. One example are uh, legumes. So I hope also this answered. Any more question or questions? I think uh, that's it. Uh, Thank you, Johanna, Thank you. for your nice presentation. Also, detailed explanation to the questions. Thank you. And uh, we're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, a round clap. A round clap to <laughs> uh, Thank Johanna. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>